All right, thanks, Chaz. Um, I just realized I, I robbed this slide from another uh, presentation, I guess, and changed the title. So it is not the Thomasville History Center. It's not the Wilbur Scott Parker. And it's not January 16, 2022. So don't worry. But uh, I am Kevin Robertson, though. So that part was right. I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, about old fields today, important topic, uh, especially here in the Red Hills region. And, uh, you know, this is kind of the area we'll be mostly focused on today, North Florida, uh, South Georgia. Um, <clears throat> You know, as, as all of you know, I think we, we can kind of break down our, our upland. And I'll be talking about um, kind of clay hill habitats too, I should specify, sort of uh, areas that are in ultrasols that are managed for uh, upland pine ecosystems. And we can kind of divide them up into maybe three main categories. We're probably most familiar with the longleaf pine wiregrass native community, and then the loblolly pine shortleaf pine old field community that's arisen from old abandoned fields from decades in the past. And then there's also this uh, other community type we're doing some research on now to bring up awareness to the, the shortleaf pine uh, blue stem native plant community, but we're not going to talk about it too much today. Um, you know, some of the old fields are very old in this area. You go back to uh, the indigenous or Native Americans in the area. Um, you know, DeSoto, when he rode through this area in the 1500s, described uh, almost a continuous cornfield going from about where Tallahassee is now to um, you know, Lake Miccosukee area. Uh, you can see this old map here, the Appalachian old fields. This is from what 1778 Joseph Purcell map in Tallahassee is that kind of dark spot in the middle. So you can kind of see how extensive some of these old fields were even at that time. Of course, uh, most of those areas ended up being farmed later um, because of the, you know, the, of course the Native Americans knew where the rich soils were and the farmers who came after them knew where they were. And so um, a lot of these areas ended up being turned into, into farms during the antebellum period and then after the Civil War during the sharecropping era. Uh, pretty, good, pretty good farmland, relatively speaking, in the Southeast. And then for various reasons, the economic, the, the end of the Civil War, the crash of cotton prices and, and uh, other changes in the 1920s and 30s, there's a lot of abandonment of farmland. Um, but you can see that from the area of, uh, that are remaining untilled in these uplands in the Red Hills region between Tallahassee and Thomasville, that these, these green areas, which are basically longleaf pine wiregrass today, represent only about 15% of the landscape and most of the rest of the uplands are, are these old fields if they're being frequently burned. This is a picture of uh, tall timbers in 1929, aerial photograph. So you can see all this white here was basically fields at that time. So even as late as around 1930, there are still a lot of fields and uh, most of these have been abandoned and are frequently burned now and are now uh, upland loblolly pine, shortleaf pine communities that are managed for northern bobwhite. But you can see from some of these old pictures, like in the 1930s and Henry Beetle around 1910, that um, in these relatively young old fields that they burn annually at that time, mostly in the winter or right after quail season, usually right at the end of February, uh, they had a lot of, a lot of broom sedge. And I think that annual burning was really good for promoting that, uh, those early successional grasses, especially Broom sedge or Antipogon virginicus, <clears throat> and it was pretty pretty continuous in those areas. Uh, so, you know Herbert Stoddard lighting the annual fire here in the broom sedge around it was probably around the 1950s or so. We know from um, some dendrochronology research that we did in, in collaboration with Gene Huffman and Monica Rother on tall timbers, uh, including tall timbers, and, and then the way tract and mill pond larkin properties are in southern Georgia. Those are native longleaf pine wiregrass habitats, and on tall timbers, it's, it's old field habitats. But these are um, grass that you might be familiar with. They're called skeleton grass, where each one of the horizontal lines represents an individual tree, and then the, uh, the vertical little slashes represent fire scars in those trees. In this study, they're external scars, so they're only trees that had external scars that went back to you know, some of them as far back as the 1900s, as opposed to the internal scars that we use in some of the other studies. But basically, this study showed, and this is published um, in Forest Ecology and Management, that that fire was continuous from that period of the abandonment of old fields into the present. And that's been really important for how these old fields developed into what they are today, which are these loblolly pine, shortleaf pine, uh, open, kind of relatively grassy community types. Of course, if you didn't burn them, you get them something completely different, which would be a you know, closed canopy hardwood forest. And so, you know, we looked at some of Henry Beetle's diaries and just kind of got an idea of this kind of burning early in this old field period. 
uh, just, you know, I had Brianne Ward go through the old uh, Henry Beetle diaries in her archives and find all the references to, to fire and smoke. And they didn't even talk about pinelands. They just talked about broom straw, you know, burn broom straw, burn straw, burn broom straw. And because that's pretty much what there was. But over time, they, they um, you know, developed into these pine communities. We uh, did another study, uh, Cinnamon Dixon was here and I, and uh, in the Red Hills region, we, we got some funding from the USDA uh, uh, National Institute of Food and Agriculture to look at old field succession to get a better understanding of it. So we looked at four different regions, including Tall Timbers where we are, and then Pebble Hill Plantation and Avalon Plantation in, oops, Dixie is now um, Livingston Place, I didn't change that slide. But uh, we looked at a bunch of different land covers to set up a, a space for time study. Uh, and so we, using the aerial photographs, we found cropland that's still cropland now in the areas that have been, where the cropland has been abandoned and then replaced with frequent burning, which has allowed, you know, the, the arising of these old field communities at these different times since the present, ranging from, you know, recently five to 15 years ago, all the way up to 75 to 100 years ago, and compared them with other, other habitats. And of course, all of these areas um, had been frequently burned ever since the fields were abandoned, which, which is, again, is very important. This is a one slide showing what we found for perennial grass cover. And of course, you know, perennial grasses or grasses that re-sprout after you burn them are, are a really important fuel source that allow these systems to be flammable. If you didn't have any grass at all, it'd be pretty hard to burn. You know, you can burn the pine needle component, but um, the grasses are a big part of it. And you can see from this slide that, you know, starting with cropland, you have this pretty steady increase in perennial grasses over time. It takes about 30 to 50 years to get to where about 30% of the cover is, uh, is with grasses. Of course, this is compared, the, the, uh, on the right uh, side, that, that dark green dot represents the uh, longleaf pine wiregrass community. So it's got a lot more gra you know, grass in it. It's about 60%. Uh, gra um, grasses. So it, it burns even much better. So that's one of the reasons that these old field uh, pinelands aren't, aren't quite as flammable. This is uh, looking at species composition from the same study. And over here on the left, this is a, an NMS, um, it's a multivariate analysis, which so basically means it incorporates all the different plant species in these plots. And so if the dots on this chart are closer together, it means they're closer together in species composition. So you can kind of see how they cluster together. Over here in the West, you've got row crops today which are basically just agricultural weeds, right? So they're kind of all over the place. They're spread pretty wide. But uh, you get a big jump from there to just five to 15 years post-fire where they start to look a lot more like uh, the vegetation in, a, in an old field pine savanna or woodland. And, um, and then over time, they become closer and closer to these green dots over here, which represent the native or longleaf pine wiregrass community. So this shows, you know, it's pretty, pretty good news, really, that with just an old, with an old abandoned field, if you do pretty much nothing but add fire to it and some mechanical management, that over time it becomes pretty close to the native conditions. But it kind of bogs down around 50 years post-fire because there's certain species that just seem to never come back. You know, you've got the wiregrass and a lot of um, flammable shrubs like uh, the, in the blueberry family and in others that just don't come back over time. But, you know, you can restore it to a habitat that's really important for um, for wildlife communities, I mean, obviously most of the, the old fields have great quail hunting and they provide habitat for, uh, you know, northern Bob White and, I mean, north, of course, northern Bob, but uh, Bachman sparrows and brown-headed nuthatches and gopher tortoises and Sherman's fox squirrels and a whole bunch of other things, a lot of native plants as well. However, the um, plant species composition still stays pretty different, even in a very old, old field. So these are uh, plots from Pebble Hill. You can see this list of species here on the left and the native longleaf in the order from the highest cover to the to, to less cover. And these are the, the plants with the highest cover in, in the community type. I and mean, they have like 300 species in them. So these are just the, the most common ones. And you can see that this list is really different from the typical old field community. So in native longleaf, of course, at the top of the list, you've got wiregrass. It's very dominant. And it's followed by little blue stem. And then, you know, gallberry, blue jack oak, longleaf pine, running oak, sand post oak. And these are all upland native upland oaks that are pretty flammable. They have more wax in their leaves and they're pretty easy to burn, so on and so forth. Uh, whereas you look at old field at the top, you've got um, yellow Indian grass or the sorgastrums, which are, you know, pretty flammable. Then you get sweet gum, blackberry, beautyberry, partridge pea, water oak, uh, you know, they don't burn very well, right? And then broom sedge is down there. 
So, you know, for that reason, the old field habitats really depend a lot on pine needles to get them to burn. And if you don't have that, then it's, it's pretty hard to push fire through, through them most of the time. Some of them are grassier than others. So they, they do vary. And this is just kind of showing, you know, a, a backfire in, in, in pine needles and a long leaf pine old field community and emphasizing how much they depend on, on, uh, on tree cover to get the fire to go through there. Um, uh, tall timbers, we do post burn evaluations by just walking around the recently burned areas with a GPS unit and taking notes about each location. And this is, this is our current uh, uh, GPS data library here, the information that we take, you know, whether it's old field or native and information about uh, what percentage of the area burned and percentage of it that's hardwood stem, uh, covered by hardwood stems and how many of them were top killed, et cetera. And so, you know, you end up with these GPS points on the map and these burned areas represented by the blue uh, burn units on tall timbers here. And from that, we can kind of make these maps that show so the background colors there, the lighter the green color, the lower the uh, basal area is based on uh, timber cruises. And these dots on the map here represent the uh, points accumulated over time from these post burn evaluations. And the, the white dots are less than 50% than burned and the black dots are more than 50% burned. So you can kind of see that um, the unburned dots are a lot more likely to be in the low basal area areas, just again showing you know how the, the, the burning really depends a lot on the, on the tree cover in these habitat types, but most of the dots are black, you know, the burning is pretty good, but where you get patchy and, and also close to drains, you know, you kind of see that going on too, where the vegetation is less flammable. And, you know, here are just some bar charts coming from those research. On the left, we've got the shortleaf pine loblolly basal area ranging from zero all the way up to higher than 80. And you can see that you have to get up to about 30 to 40 square feet um, per acre uh, before you, you get something close to, you know, above 90% burn. But if you go below that, then it gets to be pretty patchy. Uh, on the right, you know, it's a similar graph, but showing the hardwood stem density over time. So where you have no fire, you have a, a higher density of woody stems. And again, this is an old field. So they're woody plants that don't burn that well, you know, water oak and sweet gum and live oak and black cherry and the like. <clears throat> this is uh, just kind of showing the, the difference in the structure between native ground cover and old field sites. Um, so in the, uh, the, the green or the native communities and the orange is the old field. So the graminoid, which is mostly grass in these systems is a good bit higher in the native ground cover. Then forbs and vines are um, more common in the old field. Again, they're a little bit less flammable. And the native woody plants, like I was mentioning, things like running oak and turkey oak and blue jack oak and sand post oak uh, and hickories that burn better uh, are more common in the native, native uh, sites in the, the inverse is true in the old fields where, you know, that orange bar and the offsite woody is representing the sweet gum and water oak and laurel oak and those kinds of species that don't burn that well. Uh, you know, more complete burns in the native sites. Uh, one year post fire, especially if you burn it, you know, one year rough, there's the native ground cover sites burn better um, than, the, than, the, than the, the, the old fields. But, you know, they're a little bit closer at two year post burn. So, you know, it's one of the reasons we burn most of them at two year fire return intervals. And, uh, you know, percent tree saplings top killed almost looks like the same graph because if you burn it, then you pretty much top kill the stems at that high of a, of a fire return interval. This is just some uh, looking at some fire behavior differences between the community types. In the native sites, um, the flaming residence time is lower than in the old field. So flaming residence time is like how long a fire burns at any one point while the fire is kind of passing through. So, um, you know, it just means that the native sites are a little bit more flashy. They're, they're less compact. The fuels, it's almost like wire grass and other grasses with pine needles draped in them. So they burn quickly and then move on. Whereas the uh, old fields, they have more short leaf pine and loblolly pine litter and more forbs so that kind of packs down tighter. So it, it takes longer for that fuel to burn off before the fire moves on. So it's got a longer residence time. Um, which, you know, could, could, could be beneficial for fire effects in places where it burns well. The fine fuel is about the same total um, in the sites that we looked at. And these are all two year roughs, by the way. Uh, yeah, I think it says at the top there. And then reaction intensity, which is like how how rapidly you lose energy on a per unit meter square. So, you know, how fast you're burning up the fuels is a little bit higher in native sites. 
and the flame lengths are a little bit higher as well, which all makes sense. So all this is really just kind of background leading up to this paper that was um, published recently in Ecosphere by uh, Matusik et al, where they were looking at um, old field vegetation up in, in um, Fort Benning, Georgia. And, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff I was saying indicates that shortleaf pine, uh, loblolly pine, old field communities are a little bit less flammable, but, you know, it, it's the dominant land use in the Red Hills region where we've been burning at two-year intervals for decades and have some of the best, you know, quail anywhere and then all this great habitat for all these rare species and communities and really high species richness. You know, you saw from those, those charts I showed you before that the species composition is pretty close to native ground cover. So, you know, I would say that old fields in this region were a definite success story, you know, to go from just row crop agriculture to this incredible habitat. So I was a little bit shocked when this paper came out that said, you know, frequently burned loblolly shortleaf pine forest in the southeastern United States lacks the stability of longleaf pine forest. I didn't disagree with the title, but the, the content of the paper suggested that um, this long, that shortleaf pine loblolly old fields are doomed to become a closed canopy hardwood forest, even if you burn them frequently. I was like, well, that doesn't seem to be true, you know, around here. And I kind of looked into it further. And it, sure enough, their soils are about the same as here. The species composition of the old fields are very similar to here, you know, similar kind of old soil soils, just up there right on the fall lines. But, um, but some of the assumptions that they're making for their modeling that they did were, were different than what we do here in the Red Hills. So one thing is that they're burning at three-year fire return intervals. And then also they are just kind of applying fires in their model randomly, just like just kind of picking dates that were within some kind of really wide window and they were using a wildfire model. So it was just like lighting at one point and the fire spreading or it didn't spread or that sort of thing. So I'm like, oh yeah, well the results kind of make sense then, you know, because we don't, we don't go past the two year fire return interval in most of the lands around here that are managed for quail. And we certainly don't just willy nilly pick the day, you know, randomly and just light in one spot and let it spread across the landscape. So I could see some things that were um, a little bit, well, not really appropriate for their model for, do, for modeling what we really do in the landscape, which allows, apparently allows the old field habitats to, to be stable here. But then this is out there and everybody is reading this and saying, you know, well, let's not even bother with old fields because they're all going to become a hardwood, you know, closed canopy forest no matter what we do. So I thought that was a little bit alarming. So it got me thinking about, well, why did they conclude that they're unstable and, and, and are they, you know? And I began thinking about the old field management in the Red Hills region and whether or not this area provides a counterpoint, you know, and, and if we are really managing these areas with fire alone. Uh, but it, it's a little bit hard to use the, the local land, uh, privately land owned around here as an example, because there is some amount of hardwood tree removal. In other words, they're not just using fire to manage these sites. Um, periodically hardwoods are removed. There's mowing of unburned areas a lot of times, a lot of mechanical, where you've got those low tree basal areas, you get those shrubby spots that don't burn to come back and, and flat mow them on tall timbers. And I think most of the properties around here. And they do a lot of roller chopping and mowing of the hunting land. So that's uh, another mechanical source of knocking down woody vegetation. So, you know, that's all kind of cheating, I guess, if, you, if you're thinking of this as an experiment of seeing whether or not fire alone can maintain an old field community. <laughs> but there's a lot of the management in the Red Hills that is not really focused towards maximizing the effect of fire for maintaining this ecosystem. But they're really focused more on quail management that uh, is kind of a trade-off between how flammable the site is and, and you know, how good it is for, for northern bobwhite management. So timber is often uh, heavily thin for quail management, for example. A lot, you know, some properties is down to like 10, 30 percent down in that range where the fire is going to be patchy and not burn that well. So that's not a management that's aimed at maximizing the flammability of the site. Uh, roller chopping hunting lanes um, promotes less flammable weeds and woody plants. It churns up soil in a lot of places and acts as a barrier to fire. So that actually you know, is acting against fire. Uh, burning is restricted to the post quail season, so it kind of narrows the, the, the window a little bit of burning as opposed to if you had all of January and February to burn. So the quail season ends, you know, about the end of February and then all the burning starts and then, you know, you kind of race against time before the humidity starts to set in. Uh, mowing unburned areas reduces pine recruitment and, of course, the pines are necessary for the, for the fuels to keep the area burning. So you go out there and flat chop the broadleaf woody plants, but you take the pines out at the same time. 
And uh, timber activity has resulted in some soil disturbance and compaction. And where you've got soil disturbance, you tend to have the reinvasion of uh, not very flammable weeds, you know, things like um, like uh, dog fennel and, of course, you know, your, your water oaks and sweet gums and stuff. And also desire for cover areas for quail, including woody ground cover, precludes annual burning. So two-year fire interval is really better. I think that annual burning is what resulted in that, that those sea of broom sedge, like you see in those old 1930s and 1940s pictures. But uh, when you abandon old fields these days, it tend to be a little bit before because they don't burn them quite as often. So you, these are some reasons that, you know, it's, on the one hand, it's hard to say that we're really maintaining these sites with just fire. But on the other hand, there's a lot of management going on that kind of um, brings into question whether or not we really could manage it with fire if we, wanted to, if we weren't doing all these things that were undermining the effects of fire. And I'm not, you know, saying there's anything wrong with any of these things. I'm just saying that there, um, there are trade-offs between making the site more flammable and providing these other management goals. But we have these um, research plots on tall timbers, the Stoddard plots on tall timbers research station. They're kind of famous in the ecological literature just because they were put in pretty early. They're installed by Herbert Stoddard, who most of y'all know about, really important historical character in the region, who was uh, an earlier early proponent of prescribed fire in the 1930s and invented the Stoddard Neal method of uh, single tree selection forestry, and also had the, the vision for tall timbers, really. He worked with, with Henry Beadle to establish tall timbers. And one of the first things he did was to put in these half acre plots to look at what the effects of um, fire frequency would be on the forest composition. And this was done between about 1958 and 1960. And um, here's a picture of Henry Beadle and his wife at one of these plots. And they put these um, concrete monuments, or cement monuments in there to make sure it'd be a long-term study. At the time, there were fire intervals going from one year fire intervals all the way up to 75 years and even unburned plots, because they really didn't know what the effects of different fire return intervals would be. Um, we discovered over time that if you go longer than a three-year fire return interval, then it all becomes the same thing, which is a closed canopy hardwood forest, because that four-year interval is enough for the enough uh, you know bark to accumulate on the on the woody plants to survive the next fire. And of course, once it survived one fire, then if it's a four-year interval, then it goes to an eight-year interval, and so on and so forth. They're kind of off to the races. So we got rid of most of the plots, um, but we did keep the one through three year plots in a set of unburned plots that we could continue to study and in, in to burn. So here's a one year fire interval plot. You can kind of see how um, the one year interval looks a lot more like those old photographs, right? It's a, a, lot, of, a lot of grass, especially broom sedge and a pretty low density of woody vegetation. And um, I'll see if this video works just to give you an idea of how it burns too. So, um, you know, the combination of grass and the pine needles allows for these pretty low intensity, but, but also pretty thorough burns in the one year plot. It's really grass driven, especially broom sedge. And then a two year fire interval plot is um, more of what is, man is kind of the goal for quail management, which is that closer to that rule of thirds, they call it, or about a third grass, about a third forbs, about a third uh, woody vegetation that tall timbers and most of the other quail properties in the region use where it's got that kind of mix. And then the three-year fire in a plot look very different, right? They're just dominated by woody re-sprouting vegetation. We're able to get them to, um, to, to burn and to be top killed, but there's very little herbaceous vegetation in it. And so it's pretty much this offsite woody vegetation and uh, pine needles that allows it to burn. And I've got a little video of it too, just to kind of compare and contrast with the one year to show how it burns, you know, a little bit hotter with that extra accumulation of, of uh, leaf and pine needle litter, um, not too much herbaceous vegetation, but you got to burn it when it's dry, you know, it's, it's with all those offsite species like water oak and sweet gum dropping the leaves, it's got to be pretty dry to uh, get it to burn. This is from last week, actually. But it does burn, and we can maintain it with that, that length of a fire return interval, at least so far, over the first, uh, what, almost 60 years of this experiment. And then we have our unburned plots, and they basically have zero herbaceous vegetation. They've just got some woody vines in the understory, and, uh, and that's pretty much about it. Of course, they still have pine trees in there, but as they die out, they're not being replaced. 
So the starter plots allowed us to kind of test this idea of, well, you know, can, can frequent fire sustain this community type because it's, um, it's kept any uh, other mechanical management out of it. There hasn't been any herbicide, there hasn't been any tree cutting, no removal of snags, no um, running heavy equipment over it. So there's no soil compaction over the last 60 years. I thought, well, this might be a good way to kind of, kind of test the uh, assumption by the Matusik et al. paper and others saying that these areas are doomed to become um, closed canopy hardwood forests. It's an important question, right? Because old fields are so important ecologically and for wildlife and for hunting and, and for cultural reasons in this region, especially. So the Stoddard plots, like I said, were established in 1960. They're only treated with fire. And the trees uh, greater than four centimeters DBH um, were measured in 1960 when it was set up. And then also in 1999 by Sherrod Herman. And in 2012, we've measured them again since then. But um, we had other information in 2012 we wanted to compare it to in the study. So we thought this was a good opportunity to look at the change in the forest structure over time to see whether or not and you know how well these different fire return intervals are maintaining this, uh, this ecosystem. So here are some results uh, from a paper we published last year on this topic. So here is a uh, loblolly pine and we've got the white dots of the one year interval, the light blue dots are two year interval and the darker ones are the three year interval and the black is the unburned. Um, there happened to be a higher basal area on the y-axis here in, in the unburned sites, but I think that was just a coincidence because the loblolly pine pretty much comes in when the, when the old field's abandoned uh, and you, when it's not burning very hot because there's not a lot of grasses yet. But once you start getting fire in there pretty good, there's basically no loblolly pine recruitment or very little. So the loblolly pines that are in there are just sort of relics from the abandonment of the old fields. And you can see here that um, at first they kind of increase slightly because they're getting bigger, but they're starting to decrease now because they're starting to die out and they're not being replaced over time. So it's pretty much the same story for all of these, you know, statistics show that they're about the same between the different fire return intervals. Shortleaf pine is pretty different. Um, in the unburned sites, there's black dots, they have stayed about the same. In the two-year interval and the three-year interval, they've increased quite a bit over time. So they're actually recruiting, increasing in size and becoming more dominant, which also is providing more of that important, you know, pine needle fuel to keep those fires going. In the one-year interval, um, they've increased slightly, but not very much because, you know, as you can imagine a one-year interval, it, the, the short leaf pine in there, they're there and they're re-sprouting when you burn them, but they're not getting big enough to be four centimeters in diameter and to enter into this census. So it's keeping it pretty open and grassy and the pines that are there are mostly the ones that have been there for a very long time, with a few exceptions. The upland hardwoods, and these are hardwoods like uh, southern red oak and mockernut hickory and white oak and, uh, and uh, uh, post oak, did I mention already? Uh, are, they're the, the, the types of hardwood species that were in the uplands historically, like 300 years ago or more as opposed to the off wood, or the, the off-site woody plants like water oak and sweet gum and live oak that have kind of jumped up out of the bottomlands after abandonment of, um, of agriculture. So these are the kind of, you know, desirable uh, hardwoods or the ones that are kind of belong in the uplands along with the, with the pine species. And they've increased slightly over time in the one year and the two year and in three year interval and have stayed about the same in the unburned. So there's still not a lot of them there, but, but they're, they're, they are increasing over time. For the off-site hardwoods, those not very flammable ones that historically were in the bottomlands, obviously in the unburned sites, they've skyrocketed and have become dominant, you know, because there's no fire to prevent them from doing otherwise. In the three-year interval, this dark blue dots, they've um, increased somewhat from 1960 to 1999, but are kind of hanging in there stable. They became dominant, like you saw in those pictures, where we top kill them, they re-sprout and come back, we top kill them, they re-sprout and come back, but they're dense enough to pretty much keep the forbs and grasses and herbs out of there. But in the two and the three year fire interval, they've stayed pretty much the same over time as well, but at a much lower level, which of course is a lot better habitat. You know, you, the, the, the hardwood dominated three year fire plots, we may be able to keep them burned, but you know, no, no quail manager would wanna see that or manager for really any of our, our fire dependent wildlife and you know, the gopher tortoises would disappear in, in, those, in that situation as would, you know, Bachman sparrows would have been long gone and et cetera, et cetera. 
this is some information looking at the uh, the biomass of the of the herbs and the hardwood re-sprouts in the understory that we took in 2012. So over here on the left, we've got the graminoids, with it, which in this case is mostly grass. And that white bar represents the one-year interval. So you can see that they really have a lot of grasses are dominated by grasses like you saw in the pictures in the video. Two-year interval is kind of intermediate. And, and then there's very little in the three-year interval. This is mostly hardwoods. Unburned is like none. But you can barely see the little, <laughs> little bar there because they've disappeared under that closed canopy hardwood forest. The forbs, you know, pretty similar. A lot more of them in the one-year interval. Less in the two, very few in the three year, very few in the uh, in the unburned site. The hardwood re-sprouts have it divided in two different ones. The left set of graphs is for biomass and the right set of graphs is the stem density or number of the actual individuals per square meter. So for the biomass, it's exactly opposite of the forbs and the grasses where you have very little biomass of the um, hardwoods in the one year interval and then they increase in the two year interval that kind of balance like we talked about before of the forbs and graminoids and woody plants and then they they're really really high in the three-year interval so even just that difference between a one or two and three-year interval over time you know cumulatively really makes a big difference in the structure um, as far as the genet density you can see that annual burning kind of keeps it low too you, you actually start killing off the genetic individuals and they stop re-sprouting and that helps them become more open and grassy as well This is a kind of a, a busy plot, but it's, it's showing the, um, the size class distribution of the trees. And I try to break it down a little bit. So if we look at this first column is loblolly pine. And for each of these different colors, the white is 1958. And um, from left to right, it's the percentage that are in each one of these categories of, of all the trees. So loblolly pine, you can see here in the annually burned plots up here at this top, it's the only place where there's a little bit of recruitment of loblolly pine, probably because the fire is kind of patchy and it kind of gets through here and there. But in the two year and three year and the four year intervals, you can see in these lower size classes, there's in the black bars in 2012, there's basically no recruitment of loblolly pine in these sites. So it, it's on its way out for the most part. Um, with short leaf pine, if you look again at the black bars in, in um, the, the black and the gray, sorry, the black bars in the one-year interval and the two-year interval, you can see that there are a lot in the lowest size classes. So this means that there are still short leaf pines coming in at the one and the two-year fire uh, return intervals. The one-year, you think that seems kind of counterintuitive. And I mentioned before that in most of the areas in the one-year plots, you're, you're keeping the short leaf pine out, but every now and then they'll, they'll come through in, a, in an unburned patch. But in the three-year interval and in the unburned, you're not really getting the short leaf pine. And this is kind of concerning in terms of the, the, the long-term future of the three-year plots, because if you don't have any pines coming in, that means the pines that you've got that are producing pretty much the only flammable fuel in those sites, they're gonna disappear eventually and not be replaced. So it actually looks like the Matusik et al. prediction of, of a transition to a hardwood forest over time with a three-year fire turn interval might be accurate, but it just hasn't happened yet in the first you know, 60 years of this experiment. So I'll let you know what happens in the next 60 years assuming modern medicine and all that. Upland hardwoods have um, increased in the one-year interval and in the two-year intervals as well. And those are those kind of more desirable, relatively flammable hardwoods that provide a certain amount of um, habitat, you know, for Sherman's fox squirrels and et cetera. Again, three-year fire plots and unburned fire plots, um, pretty much nothing going on as far as those go. And then our off-site hardwoods, Kind of like the basal area graph showed up at the top here, the three year and the one year interval, they're staying about stable in terms of their size class distribution. Two year interval is about the same. Three year interval looks like there's a big pulse of them in um, 1999, that big gray bar in the, in the four to 10 size class that uh, kind of moved into medium size classes uh, in 2012. But uh, there, there are certainly a lot more of them, you know, the, the, the woody offsite plants are much larger percentage of the total basal area in those systems. And of course, in the unburned system, they're just dominant and, and staying dominant and becoming more dominant. Okay, so um, my conclusions here are that old field pine communities can be sustained with frequent fire under a certain set of management conditions. So, um, you know, kind of what we intuitively thought, but I think this experiment was good for providing some material evidence to that end. But some of the conditions under which 
uh, frequent fire can sustain this ecosystem is a one to two year fire return interval. The three years may not be sustainable over time. I mean, we've been able to top kill those plants so far by picking kind of dry days and everything, but uh, without more pines getting in there and providing that needle fuel, I don't know how long that can last really. Uh, maintenance of sufficient pine canopy oak cover is really important in this system. And I would say minimum 40 square feet per, per basal area. Um, you know, below that, they, they do it a lot of times for quail habitat, but it, it, it will require a lot of mechanical to go along with it, I think, to sustain it at that level. Um, mature old fields are important as well, especially under two-year fire return interval. So most of these old fields that we're looking at for this research, including the Stoddard plots themselves, um, have been around for, for decades. They're abandoned in the 1930s or so. So over time, like our ecosystem services or a long-term succession study showed you get more and more grass over time uh, at a two-year fire return interval. A one-year return interval might get, get it to be grassier earlier, but that's not the way we manage the, the, the properties for the most part around here. Um, burning under well-chosen weather conditions with deliberate ignition techniques. That seems like kind of a duh, I'm sure, for most of the people in this room. However, you know, the, the models that are being used and some of the papers that are being published are just kind of random. And, and so they're not taking into account choosing the right weather conditions to burn or knowing like which part of the property to burn when. And I've also heard, you know, complaints from like federal um, managers talking about other federal managers being shipped in from Idaho or something, you know, that don't, don't know a lot about ignition techniques and like how to use the, the art of prescribed burning, like Herbert Stoddard said, you know, in some conditions where you just pick a day that's conservatively, you know, too, too wet and then put a ring around it, you know, spot or drop ping pong balls in the interior, burn 30% of it and call it burn. <laughs> Happens sometimes or, or so I've heard, you know, as opposed to um, a really more deliberate approach might be picking a drier day, but then tweaking the ignition techniques to make sure that they're, they're safe and, you know, not, not creating too much scorch, starting with the more flammable areas and the earlier in the day when the RH is high and then transitioning to your problem areas as the RH gets low, you know, those kinds of things that, I think pretty much everybody in this room are, are very well familiar with. Um, and, you know, but this is the kind of thing that not everybody who's who's thinking about prescribed burn in, in our country is, is thinking enough about, I think. Uh, allowing pine regeneration and unburned patches. I put a question mark there because we know that in the longleaf pine wiregrass habitats, and I think I gave a presentation about this before, that those unburned patches are actually really important for recruiting longleaf pine. And then the longleaf pine kind of overtops the the uh, hardwoods and then rains pine needles down on them and burns those areas out. So those unburned patches aren't, aren't to be worried about as much as we thought in the past. But in old field habitats, it's not quite so sure. One of the reasons we're not quite so sure is they always go out and mow them <laughs> if, it, if they don't burn. So um, presumably if you didn't mow them, then the hardwoods would might get big enough not to get burned next time the fire comes through. And then you've got a hardwood patch that you gotta maybe have to do some heavier mechanical with or something like that. But I'm kind of curious you know, because um, when you when you mow those areas, you're also mowing the pines out of them. I think that in some cases, uh, the, the pines might help to provide enough fuel to allow those patches to burn in the next go around. But I'd like to do some more research on that, come back with a better answer. Of course, one major caveat with all these results are that burning research plots is a lot easier than burning whole landscapes, right? And so realistically, um, I think there will probably always be a requirement for some mechanical, you know, kind of cleaning up here and there just because of the vagaries of, of weather, you get bad years, you get uh, stuff doesn't go exactly the way you want to on every acre of your whole property. And so I think it'd be pretty hard to maintain um, old field habitat with nothing but fire, with uh, nothing else to back it up or help it out. But again, we haven't really done that experiment either because you know we do a lot of mechanical treatments that kind of make the, the landscape a little less flammable in some ways for the sake of other man management objectives. Um, certainly on tall timbers, you know, there's a period where there's some not not very wise burning going on. Because I think in the 1970s, they tried to shift to more of a growing season burn in old fields, which doesn't work very well. Because like I said, you've got to pick those drier days to compensate for that less flammable vegetation. And, and so that let a lot of the hardwoods get away from us where fire wasn't top killing them anymore. And so they used a, a lot of mechanical um, to bring it back to where we could manage it with fire better. Uh, we don't have to use very much now, but we use a, a lot, you know, to, to, to mow the, um, the areas that didn't, that didn't burn. 
But I just wonder, you know, if we had been burning the right way all along, burning kind of the, the Eric Staller way, as we say at Tall Timbers is Eric's, he's, he's, really, he's really good at, at, at this deliberate prescribed burning to, you know, really hit it right on the right days and hit it hard when it needs to be. You know, would we really have gotten into that situation and needed to use so much mechanical? I, I tend to think not, but anyway, that's um, a place where I'll stop. And we've got plenty of time for questions, I think. Uh, sure appreciate your attention. Yes, sir. Have you considered the introducing the, the longer uh, groups in the in the back room where the old the lot longer are dying out? Would that would that help to maintain your your old tool set? Yeah, I think it certainly would. And we've done a lot of that at Tall Timbers too. I didn't mention that we've introduced um, a good bit of long leaf there. Interestingly, a, a pretty big chunk of, of Tall Timbers used to be, I think historically was actually short leaf pine. And that's that short leaf pine blue stem habitat that I didn't really talk about today, but is um, I think was a little bit more widespread in the Red Hills region than we, we knew about at one time. Because the Red Hills is a little heavier soil that the short leaf likes a little bit better. And so I think you know, maybe as much as a, a third of the Red Hills or something was historically short leaf. And in those areas, when we plant long leaf, they don't do very well, <laughs> they kind of die out. And, and even when they do get big, they don't naturally uh, regenerate. So that's just kind of an interesting observation. But in most of the, the actual old fields, um, they, they seem to have done really well. And yeah, they, they, um, the long leaves drop needles every two years instead of every three years, or needles are longer, they're more flammable. So they, they, they do seem to, uh, to help a good bit. We haven't done it, you know, across the, the, the campus yet at Tall Timbers in part because, you know, we've been able to manage with, with what we've got, but, but I think it is a good strategy for making it more flammable. Okay. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I just forgot to mention that we we burned them in March, typically. Sometimes it slips into April if the weather's not good, and that's just to, to kind of match what has been historically done uh, with regard to quail season ending at the end of February, to match the uh, the, the prevailing management in in the region. And so they're more or less dormancy. It's kind of in that transition stage where things have buds on them pretty much, but they're pretty well cured up. They're not completely, you know, grow, growing season yet. Second question, Ray, simply. Um, the attendee says, you know, when the two year uh, fire period has intervals eliminate flexible fruit production. Would it eliminate fleshy fruit production? Well, less though than a one, than a one year burn, but I can't think of I can't think of any species that would be precluded from producing fruit or two. If you're talking about like blackberry or, um, I mean, I guess it would it would reduce Chickasaw plums or some of or, you know crab apples, some of the um, fruit producing trees, but we have a lot of fruit fruit producing shrubs as well. You know, blackberries, uh, blueberries, key among them that can. Most cases reproduce within a year following burning, so I don't. I wouldn't think that it was, it's a crisis, but I'm not a. Um, I'm not a wildlife biologist focused on fleshy fruits. Greg. So, um, have you really looked at the uh, the response to the paper that came out? Did you, did you we we um, we did actually write a response, and it was desk rejected because the. Um, the author or the, the, the editor for Ecosphere said that it's a modeling paper. And then with modeling papers, you can pretty much run it all this way or that way or the other way. So it's sort of hard to criticize it based on empirical data. And, you know, I think looking back on it, the associate editor was probably correct in that because, you know, when we, like I said in the presentation, when we look very carefully at the, the inputs they were putting into their model, I was like, oh, yeah, I can see why they came to that conclusion. You know, three year fire return interval with, random days picked when they burned and random locations and then treating it like a wildfire instead of using ignition techniques around the sides. I was thinking, yeah, you probably would lose it <laughs> with those conditions. But we did um, publish this paper and, and we referenced Matusik et al and kind of compared and contrast and made that clear. So hopefully we've, we've addressed it. <laughs> of course, since then they've published another paper based on the same model. So I was like, mm. So anyway, that's that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this today, just in case there anybody had read those papers and there's any confusion about it. Because I think that most of the 
the managers, especially on the private lands where we have a lot of old fields around here, would be kind of scratching their head if they said, you know, that these sites were, were doomed to become a closed canopy hardwood forest because they certainly are important here <laughs> and, and expected to be around for a while. Yes, sir. Uh, we want to, since we're there's so much uh, to do about the national area, it seems like a lot of the phone problems have really been bench congestion, the low point local area. Mm -hmm. And so they're using more and more mechanical herbicides, whatever. Mm -hmm. Have y'all addressed that cost savings? Because I know y'all are kind of a structure for digestion here. As far as, you know, recommended dosage versus. Yeah, the, uh, Todd Ingstrom and in, in, um, in Bill Palmer wrote a paper several years back, it was more than 10 years ago, that was kind of recommending a 40 to 60 basal area as sort of a, a sweet spot or kind of a compromise, I guess, between like red cockaded woodpecker on the upper side of basal area, and northern mm -hmm. bobwhite on the, on the other side. But I don't think Tall Timbers has stuck with that very tightly. I mean, I, I, I hear Tall Timber staff recommending, you know, as low as 30 basal area or so sometimes, depending on the situation. But uh, Shane here might know better about what Tall Timber's, I don't know, recommendations are. I I'm just saying from what I've overheard, people say at, at fall field day, talking to the quail managers themselves and that kind of thing. Yeah. Our management plan that we recommend for our conservation easement right now is two to 40 days away. So for all you couldn't hear, uh, Shane, who's uh, with the Tall Timbers Conservancy, said that their management guidelines use a 40 uh, square feet per acre um, basal area recommendation or guideline for the conservation easements. So, you know, that lines up with the research that we've done as far as a recommended minimum for, for keeping it flammable. But a lot of properties go lower. I mean, quail don't need the trees. You know, so, so if a land manager, you know, considers the, the trees to be providing perches for avian predators or snakes or other things, they might go, go pretty heavy on them or, you know, different, different, different landowners have their different um, objectives and ha have different depths of their pockets for doing mechanical management and that kind of thing, you know, the, 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 uh, the more money available, usually the more they depend on the kind of heavy handed mechanical stuff and herbicides is expensive. Thank you, Mr. Kevin. All right. Thank you.